As we heard, there are quite a few policy making processes on their way right now. And each of them, to my perception, is getting really a momentum um, of having more impact than than before. The IPBES has created global headlines with the horrendous number of 1 million species at the brink of extinction. And the European Green Deal is there. The German Minister for the Environment has called the CBD um, a great hope for biodiversity, etc., etc. And still, despite all the efforts, the loss continue, um, the species loss continues. Um, what are the failures? What are the causes for this failure? And and what do we need to learn um, from these failures to make the post-2020 process of the global biodiversity framework and the European Green Deal a success? Here are two very experienced experts for both biodiversity and also international processes. They are both members of the advisory board of FEDA and they will discuss which lessons have been learned and which lessons have not been learned so far. Let me present Dr. Josef Zettle, Professor Dr. Josef Zettle to you. Good morning. He is head of department of the conservation of biology and socio-ecological systems at the Center for Environmental Research, the UFZ in Leipzig. He's also professor of ecology at the Martin Luther University of Halle-Wittenberg. And as he was born in Bavaria, he prefers not to be called Josef, but simply Zepp. <laughs> you were also, Zepp, you were also the um, co-chair of the Global Assessment of IPBES and um, co-author of the sponsored workshop between IPBES and IPBES, uh, the report on biodiversity and climate change. And you are also author of the popular, bo popular book, um, The Triple Crisis of Biodiversity, Climate and Pandemics. And Zepp, with you, um, Professor Dr. Markus Fischer is going to talk. He is Professor of Plant Ecology, good morning, at the Institute of Plant Sciences at the University of Bern. He is speaker of the DFG Infrastructure Priority Program, Biodiversity Exploratories, Chair of the DFG Senate Commission for Fundamental Issues in Biodiversity, and also member of the panel of IPES, and also member of the German Advisory Council on Global Changes, which is called W. BGU, VBGU in German. So you both are really both very experienced scientists and you're very much into translating this science into policy processes. And you will give a tandem talk for 20 minutes. And after that, you will answer the questions of the panel of the participants. So please feel encouraged, send us your questions. Zepp and um, Marcos are going to answer them. So the floor is yours. I'm really looking very much forward to your, um, well, you to your perspectives. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot, uh, Mr. Busse. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. And um, we are, of course, also looking forward to many questions. So please, uh, as mentioned, make use of the option to ask questions. Sepp and I, we will not really give a talk. We will rather have a discussion amongst the two of us for 20 minutes. And um, as mentioned, IPES assessments are probably the most comprehensive compilations of knowledge related to biodiversity, of course, building on, on uh, knowledge provided by others. And so maybe that is a good starting point for uh, this discussion uh, on, on a scientific evaluation of lessons learned. So my question to you, uh, Seb, is concerning the IPES global assessment where you were a co-chair. What are actually the most important findings and options for decision making that you find relevant in the, in the context of today? Yeah, thanks, Markus. Thanks, Tanya. Nice to be here. So welcome, everybody. Good morning. Yeah, this global assessment piece was, uh, of course, a major step forward. And to highlight uh, a few of these kind of things, it's, it's really a challenge. But I would say one of the very important aspect was, of course, this transformative change issue, which we have now every day, everywhere. People talk about this, but it depends on how you define this. So we in the global assessment, together with the governments and the summary for policymakers, 
agreed on a kind of definition which is a fundamental system-wide reorganization of technological, economic, and social factors. So these are kind of, these are all included there, including paradigms, targets, and values. And I think that's a quite important component, the targets and values uh, issue. And we also concluded, for example, that the plausible scenarios which include this kind of change uh, can be really compatible with the 2030 sustainability objectives, the SDGs, and the 2050 vision for biodiversity. And we highlighted, for example, there are three important components uh, which are really important to reach this. And one is the changes in production and consumption of energy and food. So that was 20, 2019. It's more clear than ever. That's exactly one of the important topics, taking the Ukraine war as an example, energy and food. It's also about low to moderate population growth. That's something which is a bit harder to tackle. It also depends very much on the different, let's say, constellations we have in the north and in the south of our globe. And the third one we highlight is nature-friendly and the socially fair climate adaptation and mitigation activities. Here comes this uh, climate change and biodiversity issue we dealt with in the IPS ipcc joint report, for example. But when I stick to the global assessment, we had one of these, uh, let's say, key messages which said that the key component of sustainable pathways is the ev evolution of global financial and economic systems to build a global sustainable economy. And the one core element was to steer away from the current limited paradigm of economic growth. That's a very big issue. That's an international one beyond the European Union, I would say. It's a global one, but it's something we have to tackle. And that's something we can only, only work on, I think, on this uh, large scale. It's a matter of attitude, it's a matter of value, of course, which doesn't say this, the GDP is maybe just one indicator of many we might have out there, but it's one which is, let's say, far too dominant. If you break down in more detail things, what I found quite interesting and relevant is that uh, it's about food systems, so food energy I highlighted already. And we said this has to be the promotion of sustainable agricultural and agroecological practices. Agroecology partly is a philosophy, but also as a scientific discipline. And of course, to empower producers and uh, consumers to transform the supply chains and to facilitate sustainable and healthy dietary choices. That's also some of the subjective highlights I would I would put there. And challenges relate to the climate change, native deterioration, and achieving a good quality of life for all, which are all interconnected. So that's an important component. And I just want to pick out one more point, which I think is very important as nowadays. We said that the large-scale deployment of intensive bioenergy plantations, especially if they're monocultural ones, will likely have negative impacts on biodiversity and can threaten food and water security, as well as local livelihoods. So I think this is something which is uh, an important element also for discussion in future development, just to pick out a few elements. But Marcus, what do you think is, uh, let's say, findings from your point of view, which are quite important also from the IPES, ECA, European and Central Asia Assessment, you have been co-chair of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Seb. So, uh, of course, we observed the same trends for the region of Europe and Central Asia that was also observed for uh, globally. Of course, we also very much emphasized that Europe has a large footprint elsewhere, a large environmental footprint elsewhere. And we also found quite some success stories. If people, if there is a will to do something, there can be some success. But of course, um, the truth, as we say in football, is is on the pitch. So, and on the pitch, biodiversity is is declining, and ecosystem services are also declining. So, in terms of the options, I fully agree with with what you have said. Um, one very important option is a little sad that we, we need to still say that which has been highlighted in the ECHA assessment is also that actually we should realize and implement established policies because a lot is known already a lot has been already established but simply not implemented so that is still and remains a, a very major option then um, <clears throat> continued education knowledge sharing is very important participatory decision making not only like top down mixing policy instruments and uh, mainstreaming across the sectors and <clears throat> here it's not only about forming the awareness and formulating objectives which is probably quite good already but it's really about designing and implementing the instruments so that's in in addition to uh, to what you said. Now, um, Seb, earlier we heard about the European Green Deal from the 
commissioner and from the director general environment. So um, in how far do you feel this European Green Deal actually realizes promising options outlined by IPES or also by the IPCC or other science policy interfaces? Yeah, it was well, maybe by coincidence or maybe not. This this Green Deal was uh, the first document was in December 2019. It was just a month after we had this global assessment thing. And I could notice there was quite some impact, in, at least in the wording now at the first stage of what we've done. There is a little citation of the, the drivers we have there, the analysis we did on this, let's say, importance of land use change, of the exploitation, of climate change, and etc which found its way directly into this document, which I found as a very important first step to be aware of these things. And also then the, the, the Green Deal also f uh, emphasizes that they want to focus also on the CBD activities, which have been delayed quite a bit, as we know now, it will be happening in Montreal very soon at the end of this month, actually in early December. And I think this uh, Green Deal text has also set the kind of basis or starting point for getting much more biodiversity issues into the into the picture into the overall activities and it was a bit focused on the natura 2000 network it was my impression i had so it's a kind of let's say a very european way of thinking and i think natura 2000 is just one of the important things but that's something where we can implement some of the measures of course but it has to go beyond that one but also some points i mentioned there's for example a headline which is called um it's about the design of I think deeply transformative uh, policies, which is mentioned there, is about rethinking the policies for clean energy, for example, or industry and production and consumption. Well, I have the impression there it's it's moving in a very good direction. Let's see how it's further implemented. It's a long process, as always. You have to be patient, and I'm not sure whether this transformation is something which people have really on the agenda as a kind of let's say very complete reorganization, as I mentioned before, or let's say doing more let's say some repair work here and there. I'm not sure about this. I think the the, the wording is okay. The practice at the moment is still uh, developing. Let's put it like this. So I'm a bit skeptical here, but I'm also optimistic because I'm very let's say. Uh, I was very very satisfied that our work from this assessment, especially the IPES and also the IPCC ones, really found their, let's say, reflection in this text and also now in the activities uh, which is going on. And I think one thing is uh, the, the Green Deal wants to make consistency, consistent use for all policy levels. And that's something which is about, let's say, coherence, about cross-sectoral activities, which is a, a big thing to do. And it's still, it's very difficult. I notice also national levels, but also internationally, it's not very easy to really have this kind of consistent and uh, congruent activity on the policy side. So this is some of the impressions I have from the Green Deal text, but I was very surprised by the text. And I think at least that it gives some hope that we do our work also with some, let's say, real impact, at least on the, let's say, mainstreaming side. That's something you mentioned, uh, Marcus, in the context of the education, for example. It's also mainstreaming is an important component. But uh, you have been involved in this global biodiversity framework issues, I think, as well, or at least uh, you have some insights there, Marcus, which is under negotiation in the CBD. And do you feel, as far as you can say now, that it realizes these promising options outlined by the processes, also by the Green Deal, for example? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, the IG targets have been missed, and we urgently need a new global biodiversity framework. It's under negotiation. So what can we say so far? I would say that the process and also the, the latest draft on the negotiation indicate quite some uptake of, of the ideas that you mentioned and I, I also mentioned. There is a clear theory of change in the draft. There are four goals which are related to conservation, sustainable use and benefit sharing. So that is pretty much the bread and butter of the Convention of Biodiversity, but there is also a fourth goal on implementation, which I think is very important. It is, a, of course, a big, uh, big step forward to really highlight the implementation gap. Now, if you look at the 22 targets that are formulated, there's someone reducing the threat to biodiversity. It's, of course, now uh, a question also of the numbers. Will 30% uh, protected area or other area-based conservation measures will be agreed upon and 20% restoration as a, as a goal. Um, if so, then it's a big progress. If not, then the uptake is obviously not so good. Drivers are addressed, which is very good, including climate change, so which is actually beyond the, 
scope of, of the convention that is uh, is also very good that this is mentioned. Then the other targets on sustainable use and benefit sharing are on a very good way. And finally, many targets on implementation, of course, have a negotiation challenge. There is a number of $700 billion per year mentioned, $500 billion to be raised from uh, harmful subsidies to be directed in meaningful ways, 200 more, 200 million more for conservation. We will see what these numbers are, will, what will be left of these numbers after the negotiation. But I think in order to make it a real Paris moment, this global biodiversity framework later in, in December in Montreal, so make it a Montreal moment, it all depends on not only on the strength of wording, but it also very much depends on the numbers that will be left. So I'm very hopeful that the targets will be good, but targets is of course always only targets. So um, even so the EU and globally decision-making seems to take up quite a few of the options. My question to you is now, what do you actually see as the biggest remaining gap between options and realized policies? If you go back to what you just said, of course, if you take the CBD, the Montreal thing, I think the elephant in the room is uh, is the financial part, of course. So that's one important component. So we we could surely agree on targets. We have been quite successful in agreeing on targets already before, the IG targets, for example. So this is also a process which is not easy, but you can always find some, let's say, common names about how to implement this. But I guess the, the biggest gaps... Uh, well, I think it's a matter of mindset, which is not so easy to deal with, of course. No? It's about, as I said before, this, this social narrative and value uh, aspect, but also something we put out on the global assessments about governance issues. There's a very important component and economic systems. So they're all things which are not in the natural science sphere where we are working from my point of view. And it's also about equity and about cross-sectoral planning and incentives, of course, and subsidies, this kind of things is also. So it's a, it's a set of things which is very hard to prioritize because they also have to go in concert. So I think this is a, one highlight, I would, I would put, one important thing I would mention here. Being a, a natural scientist, mainly, it's more about the indirect drivers, about the, the, the system we have as humans. And what's, what's your take on this, Marcus? Where's the biggest gap from your point of view? Well, thanks, Seb. I would agree with what you said. Um, I would think that, of course, targets are only targets, so we have to see for the implementation, and I think there is a major implementation gap, as I, as I mentioned already. Then um, the EU Green Deal and the Global Biodiversity Framework are not completely cross-sectoral. I would think that national accounting GDP or more accounting of business, definition of taxes, definition of subsidies, definition of trade agreements and tariffs. All of that is partly beyond these frameworks we are talking about. And so the mainstreaming of biodiversity across all the sectors, that is of, of course remains a, a major challenge. But I agree that the EU, EU Green Deal is a big step forward, but I think there is still quite a gap in in complete mainstreaming. Um, now, of course, as scientists, we always also acknowledge knowledge gaps. We know a lot, and we provide that knowledge to to policymakers and to society. But there is, of course, also always knowledge gaps. So, what do you see as um, <clears throat> major knowledge gaps that could be helpful to, to be filled? Uh, thanks, Marcus. Yeah, I think uh, one knowledge gap is the, is the knowledge gap itself. I mean, how to overcome these knowledge gaps, how to overcome the implementation, so the, to overcome the uptake of knowledge. So how to, can we do this? So we have to have knowledge about how to fill knowledge gaps. It's a kind of, it's again, social science related. I think that's one important component. It also includes things like uh, how you treat and analyze and deal with lobbyism, for example, and how to take people on board. On the more science part or natural science part, I think, for example, this uh, thinking in dynamics is quite complicated for us. We are, let's say, familiar with planning, which is kind of stat static thing. 
But in, given the change in land use, change in climate, you have to think also in a dynamic way across landscapes, for example. So it's about connectivity about uh, of, of habitats, it's about adaptation to climate change and the, the land use in this direction, for example. It's just one of the or two of the highlights I would like I would like to make here. Uh, what's what's your your impression? Well, you're also a natural scientist mainly, but also kind of let's say mm -hmm. others as well. So <laughs> what what do you think? Well, I guess we both turn somehow generalists. <laughs> I would think knowledge gaps are in, in local knowledge. There are all these geographic gaps also in, in biodiversity knowledge. I think a major knowledge gap is about mechanisms. How exactly does biodiversity promote human well-being? <clears throat> How exactly do uh, <clears throat> human values affect biodiversity? And then um, I think we lack knowledge about interactions between drivers knowledge about future scenarios and definitely knowledge about pathways. How can we actually achieve these sustainable futures that the EU Green Deal and also the <clears throat> Global Biodiversity Framework are, are wanting, are predicting? How do we actually get there? So there's, a, I think, quite some knowledge gaps. And that, of course, includes, as you rightly say, how can we overcome obstacles? And I would also want to add, very importantly, how can we actually trigger individual action? It's not only top down from policymakers to the citizen, to the individual, but it's of course also bottom up, individual action counts. How can that be triggered? So just a few knowledge gaps here now. And that maybe also brings us then to the, to the wider role of science. I mean, we are provide policy rele relevant knowledge. Of course, there is also people who are taking to the streets, gluing themselves to the roads, uh, scientists speaking out as activists. Given the urgency to act, which role do you actually see for science in contributing to bending the curve of biodiversity loss? Yeah, well, um, I would I try always to distinguish between the, the, the role as a person, as a citizen, and the role as a scientist, which is not, of course, it's not trivial, it's very obviously. But uh, the, the role I see for science is, let's say, providing the information, bring it across to as many different groups as possible. So be open-minded, go into the exchange, tell people what, what the insights are, but not telling them what they have to do, but at least what are the options are, what, what will happen if you don't do this, or that, this and that, or the other way around, what might be improved if you are active, if you consume in different directions. And of course, providing also all these more activist parties out there with information. And I think many of them, like Fridays for Future, for example, take out quite a lot of this information in a very, let's say, coherent way. I think that they are the best users, actually, of the things we produce, is my impression, even more than the policymakers. That's at least my take of things. I have, I'm not an activist. I, I try not to be activistic, but at least I try to provide everybody who's interested, and maybe even those who are not yet interested, for information to make them interested. What's your approach? I think it might be similar, I guess, as far as I know, you know. Yeah, I think I have the same stance. So I'm also trying to be policy relevant. So providing information to policymakers and also to society. Of course, we, that also helps shaping the narrative of society. And of course, it is the voters, it is the electorate, it is the public opinion that also counts. So in that respect, providing relevant uh, information is super important. So I, I agree with that. Um, I would leave it to everyone to be become an activist also, but um, of course, people should then separate a role. And my last word here is, we have heard from the ERC. I think there is also a role to science funding. In addition to the funding instruments and the organization of science that we have, we should also have new instruments that allow for the transformative science that is now also needed in, in addition. And I think with that, we can conclude our conversation, Seb, uh, to the relief of Mrs. Busse and everyone. So we are looking forward to to learn more during the conference and now to answer some questions. Thank you, Markus and Seb. Don't run away, please. No, because you were uh, talking about information and um, and uh, yeah, well, making people know what's at stake about biodiversity. Volker Mosburger wanted to know. Um, 
saying that the success of political decisions and regulation depends on the participation of all stakeholders of the of the um, of uh, the stakeholders because they understand the necessity of a regulation to what extent does knowledge and perspective of stakeholders also included in the science policy platforms such as ipbes and ipcc so you have already talked about the importance of information information but um do these platforms also have to be have to work differently? Um, do stakeholders also have to be included in these platforms? If I may start, Marcus, just briefly about from the let's say from the global assessment, I think the entire stakeholder issues, but also this local knowledge part, which is a, for me goes along in the same direction, was a core activity we had there. And also I think in the best processes nowadays, it's always it's everywhere the same that we really have lots of inputs from stakeholders, very different kinds from businesses also, which links to the topic of the day, of course. Uh, and also to take these things on board as different views. But the whole process we have is really designed to be as ex inclusive as possible. So I guess we made some good progress there. And if I look just at the a local knowledge topic, which is related. I think Deripas is a good example, and IPCC was a bit more, what they say, strict. I would say we are a bit more open uh, in these processes to really have these uh, different knowledge uh, systems also on board. Mm -hmm. Maybe <clears throat> just to add, I, I agree that <clears throat> stakeholder is all very well recognized in in IPCC and IPCC. I would I would think in, in CBD, is, which is of course a, a more political process, is um, they are also heard and, and recognized, but of course it takes a participatory approach uh, all along the way to, to the ground, to the implementation. And so I think encouraging more stakeholder involvement and earlier stakeholder involvement, because stakeholders are very often those who actually have to take the action. That is something that still needs to follow up, but not maybe not so much in, in EPIS and the CBD, but <clears throat> all along the the way to the ground action then. I do have another question by Ursula Schmidt yeah? and she wants to know with the water framework directive, we have a very strong tool for water. In your view, how can we enforce and support the implementation of this important directive? I agree. Thank you so very much for this question. So, I mean... <laughs> Marcus, you want to start? <laughs> I can give a... The start. I'm not um, an aquatic specialist, but I I agree that the water framework directive is very strong tool, and I mean it's also quite su successful to some degree. But there is a of course also <clears throat> a lot of leeway for improvement, and <clears throat> I think it is has to be taken serious, has to be uh, implemented and enforced, and not only by the by the authorities in the, in this case, the water corner and the conservation corner, but across all the different sectors. And of course, when other sectors are behaving in an overriding manner, then um, the water directive itself cannot solve everything. And so I think that is, is really a nice example where cross-sectoral interplay coordination with other policy making and with other implementation actually plays a role so there is a, a, a lot of <clears throat> space i think for for round tables to get actually really the opposing forces together i think that would be my take for a way forward here and i think it's also still an issue also of, of legal uh, activities so i think sometimes it needs the legal framework which really is implemented and enforced and I have the impression for example in the business sector uh, many of these companies are very much in favor of having let's say strict regulations because then you can really plan with these things I was, I, sometimes I'm surprised when the proposes say well that's very obvious of course we need this and I always thought it's a bit tricky to make this kind of uh, uh, let's say strict rules and, and, and legislation but I think it's exactly what we need at least for some of the stakeholders some of the businesses Thank you so much. We are already running out of time with now the questions coming in, but maybe you can answer them in the in the chat. I would love to continue, but <laughs> time tells us to to press ahead. And um, I thank you very much, Professor Josef Settler and Professor Markus Fischer, for your ideas and for your well calls for action on all the different levels. Um, 
be it as a scientist and also as an activist, maybe I'm interested. <laughs> I'm interested in what you decide to be in the future, also. So let's all together let's hope for a good outcome out of these um, of, um, out of these options, and let's see what is happening in at the COP15. Thank you, Zeb, and thank you, Marcus. Thanks, Daniel. So thank much. You. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zeb. Bye bye. So you will keep following uh, um, the, the conference, um, but now in the following half hour, we will talk about the economy as we have already heard that it is important to, to talk to stakeholders and to make them be part of the decision making process and to see what their role could be. Um, so how can companies in the private sector contribute to the protection of biodiversity? This is becoming more and more relevant as the European Union has started several new different um, reg regulation systems regarding sustainable finance, reporting obligations for companies on biodiversity. And these are really good news. The CEO of the Value Balancing Alliance is here with us today, Christian Heller. Hello. Good morning, Christian. Good morning. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Let me introduce you to, to our audience. You hold a master in philosophy. Um, and then before joining the Value Balancing Alliance. You have worked for the BASF, Value to Society program. You are also a member of the advisory group of the Shifts Valuing Respect project, and you're a member of the Nature Capital Coalition advisory panel. So you're connected um, in with a lot of people who are working on the topic that you're working on, that you're telling us about now, um, you're trying to find a new business doctrine, risk, return, impact, and you're trying to yeah, convert economy to a system that maintains biodiversity. I mean, this is at least what I got. Please tell us, Christian Heller, mm -hmm. about the plans to revalue um well, the, the, the outcome of businesses regarding biodiversity. We are very much looking forward to your talk. The floor is yours. Many, many thanks again for having me. I'm trying to pull up a few slides to visualize a little bit um, my talk. So it comes up. Yes, give me a second. So I think this should be possible to be seen by you. Um, so, first of all, what I try to introduce today is what Seb introduced also, we have a paradigm shift in businesses as well, which affects the whole society and for sure also businesses. What we need to think about in the end is how do we measure certain aspects around sustainability, which goes beyond just financial figures. And we as businesses, yes, I usually make the example, we are used to talk English since many, many hundreds of years, which is just financial figures. But it was pointed out today in the morning by the colleagues from the European Commission, but also by Sepp and Markus before, we need to be much, much faster to drive this transformation we are in. That means next to English, meaning financial figures, we need to start to talk three different additional languages within business. This is around human capital, which is around social capital. And here in this context, most importantly, also we need to talk about natural capital and how do we integrate these four different sorts of capital into one steering and disclosure system. And this is in the end the work many, many initiatives currently are doing within the business community. So the Value Balancing Alliance is a non-for-profit organization, which is um, one of the pillars in uh, contributing to this movement. The USP of us or the uniqueness is that the companies who are engaging here in the Value Balancing Alliance are contributing to the development of methodologies and are also testing and piloting directly these new methodologies and database business practices with the main objective to understand what kind of new methodologies, how you're measuring sustainability performance of a company can be directly integrated into business decision making, but also into business steering. So you can also say we are working more or less in an operation at an open heart, how we're integrating more or less directly sustainability aspects into management accounting systems. Why are we doing this and why do we need to go for impact? 
I think it's rather clear some of the main challenges we are facing have been pointed out um, during the morning already. And this is for sure affecting businesses as well. And businesses are confronted really with totally new consumption patterns, with totally new requests from society. Fridays for Futures were mentioned. And also it was um, set out, yes, we have new finance strategies, sustainable finance is one part, and new regulations mainly coming up from the European Commission. In this context, companies and businesses are asking a few key decisions which are really changing the business paradigm. The first one is, how do we really define business success? So here we have the movement from shareholder maximization up to what the World Economic Forum calls stakeholder capitalism. The question then is, how do you define success if it's not just around financial figures? Think about trade-offs, the net zero movement within companies, but also commitments to biodiversity. And then if you have a trade-off, between financial KPIs and these KPIs, what does success look like and how do you value it? So how can you really understand what is worth, what is good sustainable performance and how do you report? The next key point is with regard to definitions and external disclosures, how do you steer companies? Because if we have trade-offs, nobody at this point in time really knows what is good and what is bad. And here we definitely need to push forward in a multi-stakeholder conversation, as also Volker pointed out. Stakeholders are so important to get them in, be it scientists, be it other groups, who really can define how steering and performance needs to look like. And last but not least, regulation was mentioned. We really need to talk about regulation. We need to talk about new finance strategies and this at global scale, not just in Europe, not just in Germany. This needs to be a global movement. What we are heading for within the Value Balancing Alliance is a new methodology, how you can really measure and value the impact of corporate business models on society. For this, we are also monetizing certain or all environmental, natural capital, social and human capital aspects what we have in business. So what we do currently is we are measuring the physical quantities like CO2 emissions, like liters of water consumed, water, uh, meters of land used, waste in tons, whatever. And then we put a monetary price tag next to it. The most prominent one is for sure greenhouse gases where we're using social cost of carbon concepts. So why do we use the monetary valuation? Because first of all, it's language the business decision makers really understand. If you talk to C-suite people, so the top decision makers within businesses, they just do not really understand what a CO2 equivalent is about. The second thing is if you have a common monetary metrics behind all indicators, you can directly compare what is important and what is not important. The next point is with the monetization, you can integrate natural, social and human capital much better into financial accounting systems so that you have an integrated system to move things forward. Most importantly for us, the monetization brings sustainability aspects into context. Because, just take the example of water, it makes such a huge difference if we are extracting a liter of water next to a river or in the Death Valley, for example. And via this monetization and the price tag, we can define and set out what is the highest cost to society. What we have here, and this is linking also to the title of the conference, and we are looking at impact. The key yardstick is how are changes within the business model affecting, in the end, the life and well-being of people. So this is the yardstick we are heading for. So here we are working in three main areas. The first one is really together also with academics, developing these methodologies, how you're measuring and how you're accounting for different capitals. The second thing I pointed out is really introducing and testing and piloting this already in database businesses. And the last point here, we are coming back to regulation. 
This needs to be regulated and standardized on a global level because in the end, the economy is global, especially the financial market system is global. And we need to co have consistency and comparability of performance indicators of businesses across the world. Making you an example, and this is one of uh, BSF, the chemical company, how they are already measuring their impacts to society. And you see here figures from 2015 and 2016. You have this in a row up to the last year. And the key point, what we want to demonstrate, first of all, when we are talking about impact and the transformation of businesses to a more sustainable future, it's not just about the own production of companies, you need to capture in the end the complete value chain. So everything what a company is purchasing from third parties, but also how the products are used in the end. And this is what you can see here in this model. So BSF is in the middle own operation, so the production of chemical products. And when you see the purchase profile and the downstream impacts of the products. But you also see all of these figures as before are monetized, so you can really compare different indicators with each other. So how is a company like BSF is using these kinds of data? This is currently mainly, mainly for steering the company. And you can foresee based on business decisions, what is happening with your impact to society. And you see here one case when BSF sold in 2015, their gas trading business. So the effect was, and this was foreseen, that for example, yes, profits went down tremendously. But also what is an interesting part, salaries and wage payments were the same in the end, because in a trading business, you're not laying off much people. So in the end, wage payments were kept at the same level. What we have also seen is that, for example, in the greenhouse gas area, with the gas trading being sold, the greenhouse gas bar was reduced tremendously. On the other hand, we have seen that land use, for example, became much, much more important for BSF as a risk indicator here to improve in the end um, the management of land use. So this is just one example how you can make use of this data and to see at a really high level if you make a business decision how this is impacting your complete business model. An even more important aspect and this was introduced also by the commissioner, we definitely need to think beyond just climate. So currently the financial market, but also businesses are really focused on climate. But if you want to transition into a really sustainable business model, we need to take other indicators into account. And this is what you see here in this example, decision making. Um, so just this was done by a chemical company from Japan. Just think about if you're replacing the conventional feedstock in the chemical industry, which is oil and gas with renewables. First of all, what you can see, yes, the greenhouse gases are going to be reduced, but many other indicators, just think about land use, are increasing and therefore the savings what you have with regard to CO2, you have counter effects in other areas. And to make a sound decision, you need to take different indicators into account because sustainability is not just about one indicator. This is about balancing different aspects like as said before, financial, natural, social, and human capital. Coming to regulation. So we have heard today from um, also Umberto, the biodiversity strategy 2030. And we've also heard that the EU commission has quite some efforts running with regard to regulation of business disclosures on sustainability. So currently we have within the European Commission four main processes running when we are talking about regulation on disclosures. The first one is called the SFDR. This is for financial market institutions, their sustainability performance. The second one, the quite famous EU um, taxonomy about business activities. The third one is what is called the CSRD, the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. They're the European standards that has standards that the EFRAC is currently contributing to and providing the standards. 
And the last one, which is not yet here on the list, is the so-called CSDD for due diligence directive. This is about the supply chain management in the end of businesses. The challenge what we face here is first of all, this is just setting out a reporting framework. So what you should report and disclose. It's not really introducing how you can up, come up with the data and the information. So the number crunching, if you might say so. And here a project which we are running together with a few others, the transparent project is feeding in. This is about new accounting systems. So how do you collect data? How do you integrate sustainability into financial accounting systems? In the end, to come up with robust and comparable data for external disclosures. The challenge within the European Commission for sure is these four frameworks. How are they interoperable? And how in the end are they consistent? And unfortunately, we currently see that in the regulation, they are not really consistent with each other. That means as a corporate, but also as an assurance company or as a stakeholder, you never really exactly know what's in and what's not in and how are they differentiating from each other. Here, the European Commission is setting up a new process as of next year with the main target to harmonize these frameworks um, in the years to come. But this is not sufficient just talking about the European level. We need to link this to the international processes. And here, the IFS Foundation and the Global Reporting Initiative are, in the end, setting the standards for reporting on sustainability at the international level. We are progressing quite tremendously over the last weeks. And we hope that in the end, we will have one global reporting system on sustainability, which is called the global baseline as a minimum consistent standard for sustainability disclosures. And then as it's called building blocks approach, in the end, additional or jurisdictions like the European Commission should add on this global baseline additional requirements for corporates for disclosure. We also see next to IFS and GRI that initiatives like the so-called impact task force um, established by the UK government when we were heading the G7 process last year to think about what kind of information in the end governments need around impact to change also regulation and to change in the end the government structures and incentives for corporates in the end to be rewarded with regard to the transition and transformation we're in towards a more sustainable business model. What is quite important is a new perspective on value which is introduced by the European Commission, which is called the double neutrality concept. So, so far within businesses, corporates are more or less only looking how we can improve their own enterprise value. You could also say their stock price. What the European Commission has introduced with this so-called double maturity concept is also how companies are contributing to the well-being of society. So what is called the inside-out perspective. So what is the impact of a business model on society and nature? So you have an outside-in on enterprise value and an inside-out on society. Makes the things a bit more complex for sure, but it's providing much, much more information for stakeholders, which are fundamentally relevant to understand the performance of a business. How do we get biodiversity into this one? So there's a long discussion and debate running currently. What are the different indicators next to climate companies should tackle and companies should measure? And in the European context, we have this project called Transparent, which is introducing new accounting methodologies um, in the area of natural capital. And we have an additional process running, which is called Align as project by the European Commission, specifically looking at biodiversity indicators and how we can link these into currently develop uh, the development of current accounting systems in the area of natural capital. So both projects are interlinked, are talking to each other, and in the end with the ambition to come up with a methodology or an accounting methodology and system, how we can integrate the green deal into decision-making and accounting at the corporate level.
Another project which is running, it's called the Biomod project, which is financed and supported also by the German government, where we're really trying to bring together corporate or private accounting with national accounting systems. Because in the end, if we really want to understand the transformation of our societies, corporate accounting is not sufficient. We need to think beyond just GDP, so the GDP plus movement, and how we integrate corporate accounting with national accounting, because from somewhere also on the national level, where are the data coming from? And here we also need to seek for consistency to get the things together. And biodiversity for sure is one of the main drivers what we see here. So closing this remark and introduction and open for many questions from your end. In the end, what we are heading for is shifting the business doctrine from just profit maximization to value optimization. And we all know that in the end, the time is running. We are already behind time when we're talking about climate. Biodiversity is the same. So from us, from a business perspective, we just want to think to get things moving. We need to integrate the different stakeholder perspectives for sure, but we need to get things now operating on the ground. We don't have the time to wait and we need to incentivize companies who really try to be front runners and set the pace within different industries. So thanks for listening and now open to all of your questions. Thank you so much, Christian Heller, as the CEO of the Value Balancing Alliance for all these ideas, how to change businesses. Um, thank you so much. Indeed, we have a lot of questions and I start right away with a question by Professor Hans Jürgens. He wants to know, and I wonder whether part of the U European um, initiative that you have uh, described uh, might already change his question or be part of the answer. But um, let's hear your answer. He wants to know, um, as far as, as we see, mainly climate issues are included in ESG ratings. Why is there no or only very weak involvement of biodiversity and ecosystem services in the effort of sustainable finance? Is the European going to, uh, law going to change this or is it, are these two different things? So, first of all, yes, climate is currently the most important indicator because where we have the most science behind and the most data behind where, for example, rating agencies can build up and, and corporates can build up. And. But the other indicators are getting more and more important as biodiversity. And um, it's just a matter of time when this is going to be introduced more prominently also in rating system. The challenges of today is really about data robustness and having methodologies in place how you measure performance. And this is also taken up mainly by the financial market actors and we are driving the corporates quite heavily. So the movement, what we see within the European Commission, especially around the so-called Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, where we have a much broader scope beyond climate, will change the system. It will not be done tomorrow, but I think in the next two to three years, we will see that also rating agencies will build much more on additional indicators next to climate. Okay, I have another question of uh, Professor Hans Jürgens, uh, again related to sustainable finance. He says, while I understand and appreciate ne the necessity of, monetar of the monetization from a business perspective, I wonder whether monetization in the field of B um, BD and ESS methodologically sufficiently advanced to build on this pillar? So, first of all, we need to say, Yes, we are taking this from a business perspective and therefore the monetization as a language is key. Um, are these what we call valuation coefficient robust enough already? No, for sure not. So here we are really on the journey to come up with more sophisticated numbers. Just take the social cost of carbon. What is worth a ton of CO2 equivalents? Is it 50 euros? It's 100 euros? It's 400 euros? Um, there are different methodologies in place, but I would say, you know, it's the same like you're introducing a product into a market. If you take a toothpaste and put it into the market, is it for one euro? Is it for two euro? You do not know at this point in time. So we need time to come up with the right figures, the right numbers. And yes, we will change over time. But it's important to have, first of all, a ballpark yeah, and to get this moving. So we are currently counting with 95 euros per ton of CO2. And it's better than to put no price tag on it for the time being. Mm 
but there needs to be a common global agreement around these coefficients. And there's one project running, which is called the Global Value Commission, which was just introduced a few weeks ago. And they have the ambition to come up with these global figures with regard to monetization of non-financial indicators and in businesses. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's take another question by Joachim Sander, who wants to know how to synthesize a result from the indicators. I think the question came up when you were describing all the different indicators, and um, I feel the idea of having a number, <laughs> good, um, like a remark close to a company. So first of all, and this is what we always say, don't add up these numbers. Hmm. And don't pay off for costs you have at one indicator with positive benefits on another one. What we try to introduce here is just much more transparency also across the, uh, the value chain. Where do you create the highest costs and the highest benefits to society? Don't add these numbers up, please. And always next to the monetization, keep the quantified figures, as I mentioned before, like liters of water consumed or CO2 equivalents or whatever else we have on the indicator level. So we just need to increase the transparency and the contextualization of sustainability performance, but don't add this up. Okay. Nadja Kaspercik wants to know, what do you think about the approach to relate shareholder value to the sustainability performance of enterprises? So this is for sure something which is um, in the discussion everywhere these days. Um, the key question is, and this also relates to new accounting systems, um, with regard to share prices, yes, there are lots of legal obligations behind how you are coming up with share prices, how you're coming up with dividends, and what in the end is the accountability of the board of directors within the company. And here we have quite a lot of legal obligations running, which we need to change in the end also at the international level to introduce in the end a direct link between sustainability performance and the share price. We have this already with regard to um, the board performances. So where you have a link in the end to the bony system at boards or top management to sustainability reporting but not yet directly to share prices. Indirectly, it's reflected for sure because um, sustainability aspects creating risks, for example, but also benefits, but it's not directly yet linked. Mm. There is getting some pressure on banks to take this into account within the German yes. context, right? And right, this is correct. Mm. Mm. So this means there is going to be some strong so, yes. power in this, so, this idea. Yeah, there's a strong movement, there's a strong push in this direction. The interesting part is really currently that we are defining new measurement systems and new definitions of success at all different areas. And here for sure, I would expect in three to five years, we'll have a totally different system running on, stock, uh, on um, the stock market, but also in general on, uh, on corporate performance, how we are measuring and defining this. But for sure, it will take some time. Okay, so let's hope on this. I mean, because the risks are coming closer and closer, as I don't remember who said, who talked about the drought. So we have all felt these risks are getting closer and also for companies. Dr. Gisela Wachinger wants to know, is there already a structure or a list which we can use in the BioVavi project to test biodiversity impact of, um, of water providing companies, which is a partner of our project? I'm not sure if you're familiar with the project. I'm not familiar with the project. Um, I try to answer this as I'm not familiar with this one. Um, we have a few structures and a few lists already in place with, where companies are really creating data also with regard to water in the sense of water consumption, but also with regard to emissions to water. So there are a few figures there, but this also needs to be standardized. And this is currently what the European Commission is doing with regard to what different aspects of water do you need to capture in your data systems. But this I can also tell you out of practice, this is a huge challenge. A few large cap corporates can already do this. But for many, many other companies, especially the medium sized and smaller companies, we just don't have the systems yet in place. So this also needs some time until we have established the different systems to come up with the right data in a robust way.
Which is, of course, a lot of work for small companies who, who yes. never started to think about all these global implications of their businesses in the double materiality, as we've learned. So we are ready for the break, but I would like to give you one last question, maybe with a brief answer, as Volker Moosburger wants to know, what about the internalization of externality? It's a very old demand of um, everyone who works with biodiversity and climate protection. Yeah. So in the end, Volker is pointing out the key challenge what we have in the global market economy that externalities are not yet priced in. Um, I think we are fully aware that global regulation needs time. Just think about a global market price for carbon. And the point what we are trying to do here already is coming up in the end with a system where we are measuring the externalities And in the end, these externalities we are measuring, and here comes back to business steering, what we are heading for in the value balancing alliance, is a risk exposure. Because at one point in time, these externalities will be internalized by regulation, by tax systems, by reputational damage, by innovation into new production processes, products, whatever. And here companies can understand based on the measurement of externalities where we need to focus on and where they need to push in the end new innovations. Thank you so much. We are ready to have a break, although we could continue with a lot of questions. And you see there's a great interest in, 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 your, in your talk. Christian Heller, thank you again as the CEO of the Value Balancing Alliance in Germany. Thank you so much.